Information, please. Presented each week at this time by Canada Dry, famous the world over for its fine beverages. <laughs> Wake up, America. Time to stump the experts and enjoy a cool, refreshing glass of Canada Dry ginger ale. Every week at this time, Canada Dry sets up a board of four scintillating intelligences, and you provide the questions that make them scintillate or flop. You may submit from one to three questions with the correct answers. For every question we use, whether or not it's answered correctly, the sender gets five dollars. And if your question stumps our board of experts, you not only get ten dollars more, but in addition, you receive a complete 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mind you, this is only if your question stumps our board of experts. Our editorial staff may reword your question a trifle. Don't worry about it. Whenever there is a duplication of questions, Information Please uses the one that was submitted first. All questions become the property of Information Please and should be addressed to Canada Dry, 1 Pershing Square, New York City. Now may I present our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Clifton Fadiman, literary critic of the New Yorker magazine. Mr. Fadiman. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are celebrating here at the Waldorf Astoria, Canada Dry's first birthday of the sponsorship of Information Please. And now, in honor of the occasion, I'd like to introduce the head man himself, Mr. Roy Moore, president of Canada Dry Ginger Ale Incorporated. It is indeed fitting for business to practice the same niceties of life as are characteristic in the final relationships between people. The recognition and celebration of birthdays are expressions of friendliness and appreciation. And these are high qualities which serve to bind us in relation one to the other. Business could do nothing better than to cultivate a close and very real relationship with those whom it serves. By way of radio, we have sought to do this. This is the first birthday of information, please. With us, birthday time is the time to rejoice and be thankful. Be thankful for life and to express our gratitude to those who gave us life. And so tonight, Canada Dry rejoices as it looks upon its healthy child, information please, grown so great and strong in one short year. We are grateful for the discovery of the matchless Fatiman, Adam, Karen, and Levant, whose amazing knowledge and wisdom have become a source of delight to all who have heard them. And we are grateful to Mr. Donald Golden Paul, its creator, for his foresight and skill. We express our gratitude, too, for those many great American and Canadian celebrities who, as guest artists, have contributed so much to the entertainment of the millions of listeners, our friends, who appreciate the cultural character of the broadcast coming as they have at a time when the world seemed to have forgotten true human values. It has been a purpose of our program to test the memory of our people regarding the literary interpretation of the essentials of our democratic faith. It is also my happy privilege on this occasion to express Canada Dry's thanks to those countless numbers of people in the United States and Canada who have appreciated our efforts to provide them with wholesome and pure beverages for their enjoyment. Due to the acknowledgement of your hearty approval of information, please, we take pleasure in, the, in announcing that you may begin now to make your plans to stay at home every week at this time to keep a regular appointment with Canada Dry. We are having a great birthday celebration here at the Waldorf as Toria tonight, we wish that it were possible for each and every one of you to be with us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. And all of us here mean that in all sorts of ways. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you know, Information Please, which is a completely spontaneous and unrehearsed program, offers tonight as its board of experts John Kieran, the sports authority with a capacious memory, Franklin C. Adams, conductor of the famous Conning Tower in the New York Post, Oscar Levant, musical whiz and pianist, and as our very special guest of honor, 
the Postmaster of the United States and the Past Master of Politics, the Honorable James Farley. Now remember, for each question that's missed, Counter Dry rings up $10, and that's paid out to the sender, plus 24 volumes of Encyclopedia Britannica. Ladies and gentlemen, we're off. I'll start with a question which is directed to Mr. Farley and which is off the record. If you don't know the answer, Mr. Farley, you will not lose $10 for us, nor will anyone get 24 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica. If you received a letter with the letters SWAK on the back of it, Mr. Farley, what would it mean? SWAK. I never look at the back of letters. You never did. Well, now, you must have received from Mr. John D. M. Hamilton uh, a letter of that sort, perhaps, from time to time. Uh, Mr. Kieran? Filled with a kiss. Filled with a kiss. Yes. And by the way, Mr. Farley, I promise you that tonight I shall make no jokes whatsoever about playing post office. It will be a great relief for you. Thank you very much. All right, here we go into the regular part of the program with a question coming from Mario B. Coolidge of Grosse Point Park, Michigan. Name four songs, they may be popular or classical, name four songs whose titles express the desire for a policy of neutrality in the United States. It's the most timely question. Will I get in trouble? Mr. Levant, I haven't quite a doubt that you will if I give you any. Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Levant. Smoke gets in your eyes. Say, that's an awfully good one. Smoke gets in your eyes. That'll do. That's one. Uh, Mr. Adams. I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. Good enough, Mr. Adams. That's two. Uh, Miss Kieran. Keep the home fires burning. Keep the home fires burning is three. And we'd like to get one more song expressing our desire for a policy of neutrality. Mr. Levant again? River, stay away from my door. River? <laughs> you go your way, I'll go my way. Oh, that'll do. How about another one, Miss Kieran? Home Sweet Home. Home Sweet Home is all right. All alone. Play in your own backyard. Or Mr. Levant's favorite, I can't give you anything but love. Very good on that. The next question coming from Ruth Burney of... Maui, Hawaii. I'm probably mispronouncing the name of that island. If the island is listening in, I beg its pardon. Identify the following fugitives of fact or fiction. We have to get two out of three on this. The first fugitive is a fugitive from a statue. A fugitive from a statue. It's not so easy. What, what uh, statue? Uh, well, no. if I give you the name of the statue, Mr. Levant, you'll be able to give me the answer, I'm afraid. Uh, Mr. Adams? Pygmalion. No, I don't think quite. That's a victim of a statue. Yeah, that's a victim, as Mr. Levant says. Hardly fugitive. Mr. Kieran, did you have uh, a, a, an intuition? Well, the answer is Don Giovanni, or Don Juan, the statue of Dona Ana's father, whom Don Juan had murdered for fusion. And don't you remember that when he refuses to repent, the statue watches as he's dragged by demons into a fiery pit? Touch, let me come back to you now. Uh, one fugitive wrong. See if you can get the next two fugitives. This one's pretty easy. This is a fugitive of, of fiction. A fugitive from dogs. A fugitive from dogs. Miss Kieran had his hand up first. The uh, Baskervilles. I hadn't thought of that. Well, I, you want Uncle Tom's cabin. Yeah. Why, boy, why won't you give it to me? Well, right? I thought that was too easy. I gave it a heart of it. It may you be easy for him. I had my hand up. What, you, what were you going to say, Mr. Uncle Tom's cabin. Yes, yeah, right? very difficult. Of course. Pursued by the bloodhounds. And Mr. Kieran is also a classical uh, illusion. Axiom. Axiom, yes. It was changed into a stag by Diana. And you... torn to pieces. Uh, that's right. It's a bad day for him. Terrible day for Axiom. <laughs> the uh, next fugitive is a fugitive from a third baseman. A fugitive from a third baseman. Who was that? Miss Kieran had his hand up first. Eddie Collins. Eddie Collins. Uh, he, was tell chased us over the, uh, he was chased over the home plate by Heine Zimmerman, third baseman of the New York Giants in the World Series game of... Uh, you have to excuse me. It was either 19 or 17 or 1918. I have to excuse you, Mr. Well, Chairman. I was in France. So 1917. You were in, what did you do? Get this by television? Mm -hmm. uh, I was being supported by Uncle Sam. Good mm -hmm. job. Mm -hmm. uh, why, why did uh, Heine Zim go all the way home? And what, what, what's the origin of that error? Why should he have done it? Just why, to, just plain uh, he dumb was trapped between third and home, and uh, Heine had the ball at third base. He started chasing toward home. By the time he was halfway down, there was nobody at home to throw the ball. To Where him. was the catch? Uh, he was. Uh, he went out to eat a good book. It was <laughs> sounds like Mr. Berg. Two out of three, and we were required to get only two out of three. Mr. Farley, do you admire Mr. Kieran now by this time? I always did admire him. Yeah, well, now now it's settled. More so than ever. Yeah, it's a pretty bright crew. The next one from N.D. Rappaport of this city. Who were the vice presidents during the administrations of the following Republican presidents? We put that in just to make you feel bad, Mr. Farley. <laughs> you know the Republicans, Mr. Farley? That other party? 
I know a great deal about it. Uh, all right. <laughs> now, tell me, uh, <laughs> maybe, that was the wrong, maybe that was the wrong thing to say. Oh. oh. Uh, we, uh, some of our best friends are Republicans listening into us this evening. Who were the vice presidents during the administrations of the following Republican presidents? Herbert Hoover. Who was the vice president then? Uh, Mr. Levant. General Dawes, a very fine composer. Now, take it easy. Take it easy. Herbert Curtis. Hoover. Yes. Curtis. Dawes is wrong. I'm sorry. Gosh. Curtis. Uh, Curtis is there right. There was a big scandal about a dinner, but I won't go into it. Don't go into it. Uh, William H. Taft. Who was vice president during the administration of William H. Taft? Mr. Adams. James Schoolcraft Sherman. Probably the only living man who knows James Sherman's middle name. Of Syracuse. Really? Uh, Utica. Big Utica 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 right. <laughs> Was it Utica, Mr. Farley? Better be careful, Miss Adams. It looks as if we had an expert who might just come to you. I was going for dandy clothes. <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt. Who was vice president during the administration of Theodore Roosevelt? Uh, Mr. Levant. Douglas Fairbank. Fairbank. Uh, Fairbank. Yes, Fairbank. Charles Warren Charles Fairbanks. Charles Warren Fairbanks of right. Indiana. Charles Warren Fairbanks of Indiana. That's state right, Mr. Farley? Correct. Is Indiana the place where everybody knows uh, how to grow up to be a president? Isn't mm-hmm. On both sides of the fence. On both mm-hmm. sides of the fence. Right. Uh, well, you corrected yourself on that first one, Mr. Levant. I'm going to let you in under the wire on uh, Curtis. That gives us three out of three. The next question comes from Jay DuPont of Quebec, Canada. This is a musical question. The studio pianist is going to play the middle part of three familiar popular songs. And Mr. Levant is asked to pick up and finish the songs, and of course name them after he's done so. Let's have the first. Mm-hmm. Mr. Levant playing. Do I have to play at the same key? Pick your own key. told me to be something I'd meet someday, somebody exactly like you. Exactly like you, and uh, that's mm-hmm. quite right. Let's have the second one. Janice will play the middle part of another song. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. The Funny Face by George and Ira Gerson. Good enough. Janice? Thatcher of Milton, Massachusetts. This question about threats, T-H-R-E-A-T-S. What threats are associated with the following character? The first is Gunga Din. You have to get three out of four on this. Mr. Levant. He played a very bad trumpet. Uh, well, you're making up your own threat. No, well, uh, once he played the trumpet, well, they all win. The, right, the English win. Plus, you, you haven't read the poem about Gunga. You've just seen the movie. Why do I have to read it? I can see it in an hour. Apparently. I don't think the trumpet plays much of a part in the poem by Kipling about Gunga Din. I Remember withdraw. the threat? I withdraw. Uh, it's all right. You're doing all right for a man who goes to the movies. Uh, Mr. Kieran, did you have it? No, I know the poem, but I don't remember any threat except where he's going to go after he dies. No, that's not the poem, the threat. Here are the three or four lines. You put some jewelry in it or I'll marrow you this minute if you don't fill up my own at Gunga Din. Jewelry is pep or quickness, something of the sort. One wrong. Now we have to get the next three right to get by on this. What threat's associated with the big bad wolf? The big bad wolf. Uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, he'd blow their house in. Yeah, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house in. That's right. Remember that, Mr. Levant? Maybe you didn't go, you didn't go to... Uh... Yeah, I can whistle it. it. Sounds even more threatening that way, Mr. Levant. 
The uh, Water Boy. The Water Boy. What threats associated with the Water Boy? It's in the popular song, of course. Oh, rather.